Hello, my name's Andy. Welcome to episode 7 of Keeping Water. This week's episode is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to start by answering a few questions and then finish with a few updates from the last week. So, let's start with the most commonly asked question that's been put to me since I built my pond and which forms the starting point for this video. That question is, why no koi? I get why I'm asked this. They are what people expect when you have a largest pond. However, the answer is fairly simple and it's nothing to do with disliking koi. If you watched episode one, you'll know that I initially built my pond for the fish that were outgrowing my son's fish tank. These were two carp and five rudd. I later added a tench to the pond. The pond was designed to be as natural looking as possible or at least as natural looking as I could make it. And that coupled with the stocking defined the theme a natural pond with native species. When I lost a lot of fish due to freezing weather in 2018, I obviously had a decision to make about future stocking. However, as the tension some rudd had survived, the theme was still somewhat in place, and what I really didn't want was to have a mixed stocking, by which I mean combinations of natural and more ornamental or decorative fish. Therefore, I continued with the all natural theme. In episode 2 I spoke about the decisions I had to make when rebuilding my pond, including whether or not I'd continue at all. A big factor in why I eventually did was the surviving fish, and also a little bit of stubbornness on my part. Looking back, I often think about what I would have done if no fish had survived, and if I continued, what I would have stopped the pond with. And I think I know, I would have gone with all carp, either all native or all koi. Although my original carp were more confident than my current ones, I think having a larger group would mean they would be less spooky. I think my pond and filtration could cope with about six large carp, in place of the 19 fish of various sizes I have now. In deciding which to have, native or koi, it may have come down to cost. The two carp I have now, bought at 19 inches and 20 inches, cost, in total, about 2% to 50% of the cost of one decent koi of a similar size. However, part of me would have liked an all koi pond. I would have kept the natural look of the pond as it is today, but to have some more friendly and visible fish would have been fun. So, if I had gone the koi route, what types would I have chosen? I watch a lot of koi keeping videos on YouTube, mainly because there are obviously parallels between keeping koi and native carp, and the principles of keeping water are the same regardless. I've seen a lot of koi in those videos, and I'm pretty sure which I would go on to buy. Before starting, I'd like to thank Gatwick Koi for letting me use their koi photos in this video. I've linked their website in the description below. The first choice is quite easy. I definitely would have bought a chagoy. From most videos I've seen, they are regularly reported as being the most confident, friendly and fast-growing koi. I'd maybe even have two. So that would have left me with four more. Next then, a Showa. Again, maybe even two. They're my favourite koi that are at least partially white and orange. However, it's the contrasting black which makes them my second favourite koi. Choice number three would have been a Shiro Hutsuri. Again, the black colouring makes them striking especially contrasting with the white, while the white itself obviously allows them to be clearly visible. Again, I'd have had two. So they would have been my choices, if I could have ever have afforded them. They're my favourites and I think they would be a good mix. But, hopefully, as I don't wish ill to my current fish, I'm probably not going to have them anytime soon. Question number two. Why is your channel called Keeping Water? There's a saying that fish keepers whether they have ponds or fish tanks, don't actually keep fish, they keep water. 
thinking behind this is that if you get the water quality right, then the fish will be healthy and thrive. It is mostly accurate. Obviously fish can get ill or suffer from predation in the best quality water, but it's true that if you get the water right, you can avoid the vast majority of problems that fish experience. Anyway, that's where the name comes from, and I think it works okay for the channel. Question three, how can you work out how many fish you can keep in a pond? The answer to this is very complicated. There used to be a formula, well actually many different formulas. For instance, if you're keeping koi, you should allocate 35 gallons per inch of fish, which means for a two foot carp, you would need at least 840 gallons. However, depending on the dimensions of the pond, this could be quite a small pond for what is quite a large fish. Conversely, if you had six two foot carp, this would mean needing a 5,000 gallon pond, which would be quite huge. Applying this to my pond, and considering that not all of my fish are carp, I have about 168 inches of fish, which would equate to needing a 5,880 gallon pond. My pond is actually only about 2,500 gallons, less than half the recommended size, yet the water quality is good and the fish are doing well. So, there must be other factors to consider. The first is obviously filtration. In an unfiltered garden pond, you would struggle to keep healthy water for any amount of fish, let alone large fish like koi or native carp. It is possible though, with the right balance of fish numbers, volume of water and plant life. Simply, fish produce waste. The more you feed them, the more they produce. The more and larger fish you have means more food and subsequently more waste. Waste is obviously harmful to fish if not effectively filtered, so the amount of filtration you have and its ability to provide effective mechanical and biological filtration for the amount of waste produced is therefore clearly a factor in how many fish you can keep. Another factor is dissolved oxygen. Like us, fish need oxygen to survive, and again, more or bigger fish need more oxygen. The oxygen requirements of fish vary for different species. Tent, for instance, can tolerate lower oxygen levels. Sturgeon require much higher levels. Additionally, colder water holds more oxygen than warmer water, so the temperature of your pond also needs to be considered. To provide oxygen to the water, you need to ensure surface agitation, which allows a gas exchange to take place that adds oxygen into the water. This needs to be a constant process and can be achieved through the returns from your filters and through air stones. Plants also add oxygen into the water. However, overnight this reverses and there is more carbon dioxide and less oxygen. However, that could be a whole video to itself, so I'll leave that there. Basically, you have to ensure the number of fish in your pond and their individual and collective oxygen needs are met by the oxygen capacity of your pond system. There is not, to my knowledge, one good formula to take all these and many more factors into account. My best advice would be to learn as much as you can about filtration, the oxygen requirements of your particular fish, the potential size of the fish, signs of ill health and start slowly. Begin with a small number of fish, monitor water quality and be ready and able to respond to problems as they occur. Question 4. Do you intend to breed your fish? As I've said in a previous episode, I think my carp are the same sex, so breeding's a non-starter there. I'm not sure about whether they're male or female, but more of that in question 5. The rod are undoubtedly mixed sex, as the chance of all 14 being the same sex is quite low. The tench are two females and one male, so there's chances there. Having said that, and aside from having deliberately bought a pair of tench and letting the plants grow to provide a semi-natural area for them to spawn in, I don't do anything too active in encouraging them to breed. For example, separating fish to separate ponds, or heating or cooling the water to trigger spawning. I would like them to, but I'm also very aware that my pond, considering all that I've said in answering question three, will be pretty full when the fish have reached their maximum size. Obviously, I can move smaller fish onto good or even indeed better homes. It would be good for them to spawn, and especially for female fish, it can be problematic if they don't. Question five. How easy is it to tell male and female carp apart? It's difficult. A lot comes down to body shape and behaviour, which can be best assessed by comparing male and female carp with each other. That can be tricky if, as I suspect I do, you have fish of the same sex. Female carp will tend to be wider than male, but this can also be affected by genetics, as some strains will be wider than others. 
Also, diet can play a part, as can environment. For example, carp living in rivers tend to be slimmer than those living in lakes. My carp are fairly identical in shape and width. Another way of differentiating is by behaviour. During spring and early summer, male carp will chase female carp as part of spawning. My carp haven't done this. Male carp also tend to have rougher skin than females around the head and gill plates, especially in spring and early summer when they would be spawning. This isn't something I've checked. You can also identify a carp sex by comparing the vent area on the underside of the fish. A male koi will have a line from head to tail. A female koi will have the same line, but will also have another crossing in a T shape. Again, this isn't something I've checked with mine. I will be netting and checking my fish before winter, and I'll take a closer look to see if I can have a clearer idea. My guess is that they're both female. Not a lot done around the pond this week. I tried to do some filming directly above it, but a combination of poor lighting and the fish not joining in meant I didn't get the type of footage I wanted. My new thermometer arrived, although, as I said in episode 6, I tend to feed based on the fish's behaviour rather than water temperature, it's still useful and important to know what the temperature of the water is. The thermometer is in the shed, so the air temperature is actually the shed temperature, which may be a little different from the outside. The probe for the water is in the vortex bay, where the water first enters the filtration from the pond, so it should be pretty representative of the temperature in the pond. I'll talk more about pond temperatures over the coming months. The only slight issues I've had with the pond this last week has been the weather. In the UK we've had a couple of storms causing high winds and torrential rain. The winds gave me a small reminder of what autumn's going to be like as they blew some leaves off the trees and into the pond. The rain nearly made the pond overflow, but I pumped some out to waste to avoid it. It's not a huge problem, although the water tends to cloud up as dirt is washed into it by the rain. Other than that, I had some happy rud this week as a couple of jobs in the front garden meant I found some worms for them. Consequently, I've decided I need to get some footage of them eating the worms and, probably more interestingly, I could make a wormery to have a better supply for them. That's a spring 2021 project though. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Keeping Water. If you have any questions or information to correct or add to what I've said, please feel free to comment below or share on Instagram or Twitter. In next week's episode, I'll be looking at what I would do differently if I could go back in time and start my pond from scratch. I'll also include another weekly update. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.